In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Now, our Chaplain's Report today continues in our series on Daniel. And just to provide a little bit of context, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at this point have refused to worship the idols. You remember that we've talked about that, that they were told that you're going to worship the idol of gold whenever the music plays. And they essentially looked at the king and said, no, no, we're not going to do that. And then the king gives them a second chance. And they say, nope, we're still not going to worship the idols. And so the king gets very angry about this, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he is ready to throw them into the furnace at this point. And the way that the Bible describes it, it's that the king was especially angry. And I think the reason that he gets so hot under the collar, pun intended, when it comes to these particular men saying that they're not going to worship is these are guys that are his advisors. These are people that specifically he had essentially picked out from the crowd to be his advisors because of Daniel and because of the dream interpretation. And so these are guys with a lot of pull and these are guys that the king has been pretty good to. And so because of that, I think he's even more f frustrated that these are the three men that he's been really good to that are refusing to worship the idol that he's commanding them to. And so because of that, the king gets incredibly furious and gets to the point to where he's saying, you know what, bind them, have them tied up and throw them in the furnace and make the furnace seven times hotter than I originally ordered it to be. And so his men get together and they make the furnace seven times hotter than it originally was, which honestly doesn't really make sense. And Nebuchadnezzar is not exactly the most rational guy in the world. So I guess that's fair. But uh, if you're wanting to torture someone or make it more painful, actually less heat would be the worst way to go because then you're going to burn slower. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, that is the plan that Nebuchadnezzar has. He is so furious with these guys that he wants to make the furnace seven times hotter. And this thing gets so hot that the way that the Bible describes it is the men that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace actually burned up. The flames were so intense that just by these guys, by merit of getting near enough to it, they were consumed by the fire as they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. So this is a very, very hot furnace. And yet, we're going to see how this plays out in the, the biblical narrative. Let's look at uh, Daniel 3, 24 through 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste and said to his officials, was there not, uh, was it not three men that, uh, th sorry, not three men were cast bound into the midst of the fire. They replied to the king, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And they are the, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the uh, near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire, and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, uh, the satraps and the perfects and the governors of the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Of, of these men, nor was their hair of their head that was singed, nor of their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. So we're seeing in these scriptures that if you're these four men that are cast into the furnace, keep in mind they are bound when they're cast into the furnace. And yet, their, bound, their bonds are no longer on them. They're not Houdini. They didn't escape them from them naturally. So we can only assume one thing. The bonds burned off of them. And yet their clothes are fine. And their bodies are so unharmed that they don't even smell like fire. So God has such mastery, and this shouldn't surprise any of us that believe, but God has such mastery over the natural elements of this world that he was able to make the fire 
burn the bonds off of them without hurting them. That is an amazing miracle in and of itself, even if you don't count the fact that they just literally walked through a burning furnace completely unharmed. And one thing that is important to note, too, is that there was a fourth person in there with them. Now, there's a little bit of, I guess, religious uh, back and forth on this. If you're looking at the way that the text reads, it's clear that what Nebuchadnezzar was talking about when he says that the fourth man is like a son of the gods, he's talking about some kind of supernatural being. In other words, the fourth person in there has an, a different appearance than all of the others. And because of that, because of the verbiage that is used there, the son of God, a lot of people speculate that that means Christ. Now, that's not completely implausible. I guess it's certainly possible that Jesus Christ could have been the one that descended and saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace, but I don't think that that's what the scripture is actually saying. Keep in mind that Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan, and so in his own mind, what he's seeing is some supernatural being. Well, it must be someone who's a, a demigod or a son of the gods or something like that. And so that's what Nebuchadnezzar is actually saying, because he wouldn't have known who Christ was to begin with. So even if he believed it was, quote unquote, the son of God, how would he have known the difference? So I do think that people make a little bit of an error, even though well, well intended, when reading this passage into reading into that and saying that that must be Christ. It's probably more likely an angel. We see an angel is actually the one that closes up the lion's mouth a little bit later in Daniel. And so it kind of makes sense that it would have probably been an angel that was saying to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's needs and keeping them safe in the furnace, not necessarily Jesus Christ himself. That just seems to me to be the more logical, the more plausible explanation for what is going on here. But nonetheless, God does provide for them and God does take care of what they're doing there. And because of that, King Nebuchadnezzar has to acknowledge God's superiority. He has to acknowledge because he's, he's looking in and he's seeing this. He's looking directly at it and he's saying, okay, it's clear. The pagan idol that I was worshiping, that doesn't really have any power because you refuse to worship it and yet your God was able to save you from the consequences of not worshiping. Clearly their God is the superior one. Now, of course, we know that there are no other gods, but in his mind, this was a competition of the gods. If their God to deliver him from the wrath of his God, then that meant that their God was superior. And that's why he refers to it as the most high God. So by this great act of faith, King Nebuchadnezzar does see yet again that God in his power and his might is being with these people, that their behavior is ordained by him, that they're following his word, his commands, that they are servants of, as Nebuchadnezzar calls it, the most high. And so because of that, he has to acknowledge God's superiority and I think acknowledge that these guys actually do know what they're talking about when they talk about God. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar now at least has a basis for his own faith. Now, whether or not he follows it or not, we're going to see that there's some struggles with that later on. But the truth is, these people being in the midst of, of this large group of people that are not Jews, they're getting to see God's power firsthand in a way that they normally would not be able to. And that really is a blessing to them. And with faith, I think that the message that we can take from this is that not only can you walk through fire, but you can be freed from your bonds because of it. That even trials that we look at that we think are going to be horrible, that are going to be just the worst for us, actually turn out making us into better people. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, don't you think that their faith was strengthened because of this? And I think there's a fair bit of symbolism in this as well. That sometimes going through a struggle, sometimes going through a trial of fire, is the only way to really set yourself free. Because God has the power to burn off your bonds without hurting you. And the only way to be able to do that is to have faith in him. That he's going to be able to deliver you from whatever circumstance you have. You have to believe that your God is bigger than the circumstances surrounding you. And that's certainly what these three men believed. Stay the course, friends. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist. 
which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.